Hey humans, it's Hannah. Welcome back to my channel, or if you're new here, I do videos on creepy and disturbing things. You are currently watching our next episode in my video series, Can't Look Away, where I will tell you five different stories in this video, most likely all stories that you have never heard of or at least are lesser known. And all five of them are sure to disturb you. Now this video does have a sponsor, but thankfully the sponsor involves wine, which I will be sipping during this video because I think I'm gonna need it to get through these stories today. So I'll be right back and we'll get right into it. Thank you so much to Bright Sellers for sponsoring a portion of today's video. I love a glass of wine in the evenings, but what I don't love is standing in the wine aisles, the seemingly endless wine aisles of the grocery store with reds and whites and rosés, and it's just like too many options. It's overwhelming. I am definitely no expert, so I just have no idea what I'm looking for there. However, with Bright Sellers, you just go to their website and there's a fast and fun seven question quiz so they can match you with wines that are personalized to your taste palette. So they will carefully choose what wines are best for you. They'll send the box directly to your door so all of that time, decision making, and all the effort has already been done for you. From my most recent box, this is what I will be sipping on during today's video. I got the California Pinot Noir Still Bend. This wine has has hints of strawberry, cranberry, vanilla, and rose. It has a 12.8% alcohol content. It's a light bodied red. I'm gonna tell you the rest about the sponsor before I drink this because it needs to just air out for just a minute. Bright Sellers also has great customer service. Their concierge team is always there for you if you have any questions about your wine or about your subscription in general. All the packaging is also plastic-free, recyclable, making Bright Sellers the smallest carbon footprint in the industry. Okay, let's try this wine. That was a really big sip. It's really good though. <laughs> I'm not really good at determining, but I can say the the tastes on the card that it says are very accurate. I can actually taste the vanilla and especially the strawberry, which is really cool. Like that really helps you when you're tasting wines. Like you could hold the wine tasting at your house with Bright Cellars if you wanted. Thank you again to Bright Cellars for giving my followers a limited time offer of 50% off their first six bottle box. Click the link in the description below this video to get started. And by supporting Bright Cellars, you're supporting the channel. So thank you. Teenage boys don't always make the best decisions. But on February 4th, 2015, a 16-year-old boy made one of the worst decisions anyone possibly could. 16-year-old Maxwell Morton was hanging out with his 16-year-old friend, Ryan Mangan. They were at Ryan's home in Jeanette, Pennsylvania. The two boys decided that on that day, they were gonna play with a gun that Ryan had hidden in his bedroom in the home, a gun that Ryan's parents didn't know about. They were fooling around carelessly with the nine millimeter semi-automatic weapon when, as so many of these stories end, the gun accidentally went off. What happened was Maxwell had been pointing his friend's handgun at his friend's head thinking it was unloaded. The two were trying to take a selfie with the gun in the photo, probably to share with their friends because they thought they looked edgy. But that's when, of course, the gun accidentally went off and Maxwell managed to shoot Ryan in the face right under his left eye. And then what happened next Pretty much no one, not even Maxwell himself, can explain. He decided in that moment it would be a great idea to take a selfie with his dying friend. But what's even more disturbing than that is that Maxwell is smiling from ear to ear as if he is just so happy that he just killed his friend. Here is the selfie that we are talking about here. Of course, Ryan's body is very, very blurred out. Regardless, the photo is still extremely upsetting knowing the context behind it. Of course, for most of us in the world, the only logical course of action after such an awful accident would be to call 911. Even if you were panicked, even if you were scared, but instead, Maxwell took a selfie and then he fled the house, 
back to his house with the weapon still in his hands. Ryan's own mother was left to discover her young son's body herself, walking right in on the gruesome scene when she came home from work. Another tragedy that Maxwell could have easily prevented her from experiencing if he had just called 911. Later that night, Maxwell's poor choices, for lack of a better phrase, only continued. That night, Maxwell was playing online video games with a friend in Wisconsin. To this friend, he would start bragging about the killing that occurred earlier that day. He told his friend things like he got his first body. He also told him that Ryan was not the last one, and I told you I cleaned up the shells. The friend in Wisconsin did not believe Maxwell. Surely he was just trying to sound tough, or perhaps he was making some sick joke. Maxwell didn't like that his friend didn't believe him, so to prove it, he sent the selfie he had taken of him and Ryan's body earlier that day via Snapchat, along with a news link to the developing story just to prove it further. The other teen was absolutely horrified when he saw the photo. Maxwell, grinning from ear to ear, with Ryan slumped sideways in a chair behind him, with a bullet wound under his eye and a pool of blood forming underneath his head. After that, Maxwell would then text him, told you. In contrast to Maxwell, the Wisconsin teen would put on his good decision hat that day. He immediately screenshotted the photo. As you know, Snapchat is a social media app that deletes the photo pretty quickly after it's sent. And while it's never really gone, it was still a lot easier for authorities to get because the teen thought quickly and screenshotted it. The teen then did again what a logical person would do and brought it to his mother and showed her. The mother, of course, called the authorities as quickly as she could and told the authorities, believe it or not, we have a photo of the murderer. Maxwell was, of course, arrested very soon after this. Maxwell was tried as an adult. Probably one of the most tragic things about this case is that if Maxwell had made better choices that day and had just called 911 right after the accident, a forensic pathologist testified that Ryan had a chance at living. He was still alive when he was shot. Maxwell didn't kill him instantly, but by fleeing the scene, he left his friend there to die alone. Second to that, if Maxwell had just called 911 immediately, there's a chance he wouldn't have even been charged because that would prove that the whole thing was an accident but he kind of damned himself by bragging about it and taking photos of it. It was ultimately determined that the killing itself was an accident. Maxwell hadn't gone to his friend's house that day with plans on harming him. He was instead therefore convicted of a lesser charge of third degree murder. And for what it's worth, Maxwell was remorseful in court, apologized, to the family and was subsequently sentenced to 15 to 30 years in prison for the death of his friends and his actions afterwards. Obviously, I do not condone what Maxwell did that day. What he did was absolutely awful and how he handled it was even worse. But I can't help but think about the fact that Maxwell was only 16 years old and therefore was a child. So was his friend. If this was two adults, I think I would look at this a little differently as we all know that teenagers make awful decisions sometimes, and often play with guns without thinking about the deadly consequences. The other thing I can't help but think is that Ryan also was the one that gave the gun to Maxwell. Not that that makes it Ryan's fault, but rather Ryan's parents are who I question because according to the sources, Ryan's parents didn't know that he had guns stashed away in his room, and that was not the only gun. And I just have to wonder how you could be so out of touch with your kids that you don't know that they have guns in their room. I am not a parent though, and I also don't know this family, so really take my opinion with a grain of salt. 
They absolutely did not deserve to lose their son in the way that they did. However, I do think that since they were both minors, I think they bear some responsibility in keeping guns out of children's hands. I definitely think Maxwell, though, deserved prison time, which he got, but I don't think he deserved a life in prison, since this is pretty well accepted to be a genuine accident. He just made really bad choices afterwards that pretty much showed he completely disregarded his friend's life as important at all. r slash bone collecting is a subreddit that advertises themselves as a community for bone collecting, bone identification, bone ID, and art. The majority of posts are simply people interested in animal bones and bone collecting. Typically, a post is a photo of a bone that they found, usually the user having found the bone in hiking or just out in nature, and then they ask the community to help them identify what kind of bone it is, maybe what animal it belonged to. It's a highly respected art and hobby, and the community is always supportive of each other and eager to help others out with what they may have found. However, on March 30th, 2021, Reddit user Planetary Prospector posted on the subreddit, and their post really stood out to frequenters of the site. This person, as it turned out, had come across human remains. That's not what would ultimately get them banned permanently from the community and eventually led them to delete their entire account, though. It's how they reacted after learning from the community that they had found human remains. On this day in 2021, they posted on r slash bone collecting a title, found these bones in a cave in the Alps. Can anyone help me ID them? Under the title was a photo of bones lined up next to a ruler, as you can see now on the video. The top comment on this post was this. Well, the middle one is a human ulna, so you will need to contact the authorities. A human ulna, by the way, is a bone found in the arm. And sure enough, if you look up photos of it, it will look exactly like this one in the photo. There is no doubt that that's what this is. Other comments soon started rolling in, several confirming the only identification and others identifying some of the other bones in the photo as possible other human parts. It was pretty quickly concluded that this OP had found a human, not animal bones, and many of the comments turned to concern as person after person urges OP to alert the authorities. Now. If OP really had genuinely not known what type of bones these were and thought it was an animal, you could definitely chalk this up to a very oblivious person just simply being excited about what they found, moved the bones to take a picture without knowing what they were doing. They had no intention of desecrating either a gravesite or a crime scene. They just simply, you know, plead ignorance. Still not great considering if it was a crime scene, they just messed up the crime scene for anybody who would want to study it. However, most people would forgive the severe naivete if this is where the story ended. But this whole subreddit was just shaken by what happened next. In spite of so many comments urging him to stop messing with what he found and call the authorities, you slash planetary prospector posted another update. This time the title read, went back to the cave and this is what I found followed by yet another photo of bones, this time with a lot more of them. Their comment then read, update. Went back to the cave and found new bones after some digging. Yes, probably not very professional of me. Understatement of the century right there. So you could see all the new bones in their post and there is a photo complete with all the new bones that OP went back to dig up after being told not to. They then say in their comment, I contacted a friend who is a medical doctor and he will take a look at the bones. This follow-up post, as you probably predicted, sparked outrage in the community. Most people telling OP yet again that they need to call the police and stop messing with what could be a crime scene. And even if it wasn't, he was disturbing a burial ground. The most disturbing part about this poster though was that their attitude came off almost smug, as if they were telling everybody on Reddit, haha, I know what I'm doing is awful, but you can't do anything to stop me. And the frustration would build up as now a bunch of people were aware this was happening and sure enough, not knowing where they were, couldn't force OP to go to the police. Of course, the mods of r slash bone collecting quickly banned this user from the subreddit. 
as what OP was doing was not only very immoral, but just 100% illegal. The mod's comment in response is still celebrated by many for having an appropriate amount of outrage and a pretty satisfying response. It reads, oh my God, what have you done? You have just looted a burial and disturbed either a forensic scene or a very old burial. Either way, what you have done is careless and highly illegal, especially if this was in Europe where laws are even stricter than in the US. You were instructed to contact the authorities and instead you desecrated a person. As a moderator of the sub, I cannot condone such behavior. You are permanently banned. OP's account is now also deleted. However, I don't know how long after they got banned, they also got deleted, but I can only imagine Reddit deleted them because they seem terrible. So after a user named Ginglehan posted about this incident in the subreddit True Crime, they said that they found the website for the Swiss police where the OP supposedly was and sent the post and the photos to the police there. As far as we know, nothing has happened after that, but perhaps, and hopefully the police have looked into it and understandably, they just didn't share their investigation with us. We don't know, but we can only hope that they somehow track down this OP because they could actually be charged for some pretty serious crimes, especially because there's proof that they knew what they were doing was wrong. Either way, it's extremely heartbreaking to me to think about the fact that someone's loved one is in the hands of somebody that not only has no right to it, but also doesn't believe that this person deserved to have an investigation or deserve to have closure for the family that might have been missing this person. How many times has something similar like this happened and we just don't know about it because they didn't post it on Reddit or somewhere else on the internet? Elizabeth Mary Isherwood, or Mary as she was known to her friends, was 60 years old, but she had the heart and body of someone much younger. She was described by loved ones as athletic, super healthy, overall just very fit. Not only was she an ex-police officer, but she was now using her time as a part-time caretaker. And in the rest of her free time, she enjoyed playing golf near her home in Wolverhampton, England. A while back, Mary and her husband Clive had purchased a timeshare together in Wales, so they had a place to go on vacation together. The couple had been divorced for almost 30 years, but they had stayed on good terms and kept the timeshare they bought together to continue using it as a vacation spot. Mary was soon planning on a week-long trip to their timeshare that September. She'd asked various friends if they wanted to go with her on the trip. As in the past, they had been happy to vacation and relax with her in the beautiful holiday resort. But on this occasion, her friends weren't available to come with her. Although Mary would have loved company, this was also fine with her. She was very independent and still happy to go alone. And so Mary went to the resort and would check in with the staff there on September 23rd, 2017. It was a beautiful Saturday afternoon, and after checking in, Mary would go for a nice long swim before going back to her room for the night. It was a great start to what was supposed to be a very relaxing little getaway. Mary would go to bed as usual, but then in the middle of the night, as a lot of us do, she had to pee. So she got out of bed in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. She uses the bathroom and at this point, you know, it's like really dark. She's been sleeping, so she's half asleep and really groggy at this point and she's in a place where she doesn't normally sleep. So thinking she's walking back to her bed, Mary accidentally steps into the airing cupboard instead, thinking that it's the bedroom. For my American friends that don't know what an airing cupboard is because I had to look it up, it's typically where people store their hot water tank and it's also a place to keep like towels and sheets and clothes, anything like that that you want to keep dry and warm. So Mary walks into this cupboard by accident and the door closes behind her. Mary would quickly realize that this was obviously not her bedroom. So she would turn around and try the door handle to get out of the cupboard. But to her dismay, the handle of the door was broken and fell off right in her hands. It was pitch black, she was trapped, and she also happened to be naked because she did not wear pajamas to bed. Most likely, Mary tried not to panic at first. After all, she was an ex-police officer who was trained specifically to stay calm under these types of 
very panic-inducing situations. At some point, Mary would pull the shelves off the walls. We don't know why, but it's as if she was trying to find another way out. Perhaps she used them to try and dig her way out. She would then pull a piece of copper piping from the wall. There were marks on the inside of the door that indicated to investigators that likely, at first, Mary tried to use the copper pipe to unlatch the door somehow or use it to open it somehow. But when that didn't work, she moved on to the wall and she tried to use the pipe and just started banging on the wall to start creating a hole. The first hole she tried, some of the plaster did come off the wall, but again, probably to her complete horror, there were bricks behind it. So she obviously wasn't getting out that wall. So she tried a different wall. And remember, this is all happening over many hours. It's very exhausting and walls are not meant to be broken down with pipe, obviously. So Mary's working over hours and hours trying to find some way out. And this is where the story gets just more tragic than you could ever imagine because Mary did actually technically succeed to make a hole in the second wall that she tried. That wall did not have bricks behind the plaster. She had managed to get a hole all the way through the wall and the hole was just about big enough where she probably could have made it through. But from Mary's perspective, it didn't look like she had successfully made a hole. It looked to her that there was no other side of the hole and that it was just more wall. What Mary didn't realize was that on the outside, it was a picture that was bolted to the wall. So it's pitch black. She's exhausted. She's probably very frightened, very panicked by this point. She thinks that she has made it through the wall, but it doesn't look like it. I'm guessing it was so dark she couldn't really see that it was just a picture. Little did she know if she had just stabbed through the picture with the copper pipe, she probably would have gotten out and could have made it out of this alive. So Mary thought that that was a dead end as well. Even worse, one of the pipes that was in the closet with her started spraying water. So now Mary was in the dark, naked, probably already cold, and now she's soaking wet. Neighbors in the complex would later say that in hindsight, they believe they heard Mary banging. However, very unfortunately, all the neighbors just thought that the continual banging they heard near their home was just routine maintenance being done on the resort. So they didn't think much of it and they certainly didn't think to report it. I don't think they could have heard screaming or I'm guessing they didn't hear screaming and so they just didn't think much of it. Neighbors reported that the banging stopped around 5 p.m. on Sunday. And so it's likely that shortly after the banging stopped is probably about the time where Mary at least went unconscious, if not passed away shortly afterwards. But that means Mary has been banging and trying to claw her way out of a closet for almost 24 hours. It is believed that around that time, Mary simply became too exhausted to try to continue to dig her way out. As we kind of talked about, it's not like she just like easily made a hole in the wall. It took hours to get any sort of progress on that hole. And when it seemed hopeless, she probably finally gave up thinking that there was no way out and she was so exhausted anyway that she had to stop. However, remember she's soaking wet and naked. So her stopping this physical exertion made her body temperature go from hot to just plummet way downwards at a dangerous rate. And it was determined later that Mary actually passed away from hypothermia. Her body then was not found for another week not until the day she was due to check out. Maintenance workers had been sent to her room, ironically, to check out leaking water. Instead, they found Mary's decomposing body. Mary hadn't even unpacked her clothes for her vacation yet. Mary would leave behind her 32-year-old son, her ex-husband, and other family and friends who were just devastated to lose their loved one at all, let alone in such a horrific way. Unless you're very, very into aliens and UFOs, you've probably never heard this one. Granger Taylor was a 32-year-old man from Duncan, Vancouver Island in British Columbia. He was known as a genius to his family and friends, and he was obsessed with aliens. He would leave the following note for his family on November 29th, 
1980. Dear mother and father, I have gone away to walk aboard an alien spaceship as recurring dreams assured a 42 month interstellar voyage to explore the vast universe, then return. I am leaving behind all my possessions to you as I will no longer require the use of any. Please use the instructions in my will as a guide to help. On the back of the note was a hand-drawn map, which we believe was to the Waterloo Mountain that was about 10 miles away from the Taylor home. In his will, Granger changed the word from death to departure, and he would completely erase the word funeral. After his parents got this note, Granger, sure enough, was nowhere to be found. He disappeared and was never to be seen or heard from again. Let's back up a little bit though. Granger Taylor was smart, but he also had a natural talent for mechanics, in spite of dropping out of school in the eighth grade and being the oldest of eight children. Although he was shy and socially awkward, he was also eccentric and kind. He was seen as a mentor and a friend to a lot of the teenagers in his neighborhood. He would teach them about machinery and with their help, they would rebuild locomotives, bulldozers, cars, trucks, and airplanes. With the help of 15-year-old Robert Keller, Granger would rebuild a scale model of a spaceship. They built it from two satellite dishes that they found and displayed it on the family farm. This is a real photo of what they had made. Inside of it was a working wood stove and a bed. But this was not just a hobby to Granger Taylor, as his loved ones would soon discover. It wasn't long before Granger started complaining about these recurring dreams that he was having. Over and over, he would dream that he was abducted by aliens, and he started to become convinced that these dreams were not merely dreams, but messages, and that he had the unique ability to communicate with otherworldly creatures. He soon would build a working radio that he believed was sending and receiving messages to alien spaceships. His mental health was questioned by many, but that friend, that 15-year-old friend, Robert Keller, would maintain to this day that Granger was not suicidal. He said Granger was completely normal and completely down to earth until you started talking about aliens and spaceships. In the months leading up to his disappearance, though, it, it seemed to many that were close to Granger that his mental health was slipping more and more. He was a regular cannabis user, and one source says that on top of that, he was also taking LSD regularly, along with these mental health issues. Then it all came to a head on November 29, 1980, when Granger left the note we read a few minutes ago for his parents, and he left. Upon discovering the note, his parents, police, and others spent months looking for Granger, hoping that he was just hiding out somewhere or that he could still be close in the area. His parents would leave their back door unlocked for years after his disappearance in case Granger decided that he wanted to come home. They didn't find anything until almost six years later in March of 1986. Forestry workers found a vehicle in BC's Mount Prevost, which was close to Granger's family home. The truck they found had been blown up by dynamite, which Granger was very experienced with, and sure enough, some of it had gone missing from the home the night Granger disappeared. Then, the VIN, vehicle identification number, was positively matched to Granger's old truck. They also found bone fragments and a piece of Granger's shirt, although forensic testing was not advanced enough at this time to definitively match the bone to Granger Taylor. Either way, it seemed like this was the closure his family was looking for, and Granger was at last legally declared dead, with his death date listed as November 30th, 1980. However, this is not where the story ends. Friends actually have a lot of doubt about this theory and these findings. One friend says that the pickup truck that they found that had supposedly exploded was blue, and he knew for a fact that Granger's car had been pink because he helped him paint it himself. He also doubts that Granger would have somehow accidentally blown his car and himself up with dynamite. Granger was extremely experienced with explosives and was very into the safety of them and would not have made a mistake like that. And then, of course, they just have doubts about the bones because they could never definitively match them to Granger. In spite of these doubts, I personally do think that that was most likely Granger's remains. I believe Granger passed away in an explosion, but whether it was accidental or not, we'll never know. Well, mind you, the next 
thing I'm gonna say is complete speculation, and please remember, I don't know Granger or his family. My instincts tell me that Granger was in fact as we know much better now, people are amazing at hiding their mental health crisis. People that are in severe depression and even having these thoughts can appear on the outside to be normal and even very, very happy. What if Granger just left the note for his family because since they knew he was obsessed with aliens, it would be easier for them to think that he was just going on a space journey summoned by said aliens, and maybe they would go on believing that he's just in space somewhere, stuck in a different timeline that would be centuries to us, but only the 42 months to him, as he promised in his notes. Maybe he thought that if he had just disappeared without a trace, it would be a comfort to them because they would think that he had succeeded in his mission. He didn't want them to worry or feel guilty about him actually going to take his own life. However, that's my personal theory, but other theories do persist. For example, believers think that this was some elaborate setup on Granger's part. They think that Granger really was communicating with aliens and was really voluntarily taken by aliens, but they had to stage his death in this way so that people wouldn't be suspicious. Others believe that perhaps Granger really did truly believe in all this stuff, the aliens and stuff. He was not suicidal and really thought that he was destined for a greater purpose and was destined to go to space and travel with aliens. He really thought aliens were going to meet him that night, but it turned out to all be delusions. And so when he got there and realized they weren't coming, he blew himself up. Or perhaps when he got there, he just had an accident with the dynamite and he wasn't as experienced with it as people thought and he had an accident. Even experts can have accidents. As for why he had the dynamite in the first place, that actually can be explained by almost all the theories. If he was well, that's self-explanatory. But if he really did believe in aliens, maybe he was gonna use the dynamite to send a signal to the aliens to tell him that he was there and ready for them. Or maybe it was important for their journey into space and the aliens needed the dynamite for whatever reason. Regardless of your theory on this one, and if you do believe that the remains they found were in fact Granger's, there's still a lot of mystery to this case. We still don't know the events of that night that led up to Granger's likely demise. The film Midnight Rider, The Greg Allman Story, was going to be a biographical drama film based on the life of singer and musician Greg Allman of the Allman Brothers. However, production wouldn't make it past the first day due to a horrifying accident that would be a direct result of negligent choices from the producers of the film. On February 20th, 2014, producer and director of the film, Randall Miller, instructed the cast and crew to work on a dream sequence. The sequence was supposed to be of Greg Allman, played by actor William Hurt, on a mental hospital bed on a railroad trestle just above the Altamaha River, located in the state of Georgia. Even though the producers of the film assured the cast and crew that it was safe to film on that location, they were, as you probably predicted by now, wrong. Unexpectedly, while filming, a CSX freight train came barreling around the corner at about 58 miles per hour, which took the crew completely off guard giving them less than 60 seconds to evacuate the tracks. But it wasn't just the actors and the crew. They had all their camera equipment with them. And of course they had that heavy, large metal hospital bed. Now to understand the situation they were in, here's a photo of the trestle that they were on. I'll show you the video of this later. As you can see, there was like nowhere for them to go except towards the train that was barreling at them at full force. If it weren't for the hospital bed, everyone actually probably would have survived, I'll bet maybe injured physically and emotionally. However, what happened is they couldn't get the bed out of the way in time and the freight train would hit the bed. Several of the crew members were trapped on the trestle as the train went through. The bed would shatter upon impact, sending shrapnel towards the cast and crew, injuring several of them. But 27-year-old camera assistant Sarah Jones would be struck 
by fragments of the bed, which would throw her into the train that was passing by and killing her right there and then. Seven others were injured, with several being taken to the hospital for treatment. I'm about to show you the full video clip from the train's point of view. It's a little grainy, but you'll be able to see the cast and crew shuffling to get out of the way of the train, and you'll be able to see the hospital bed. You'll then clearly see that the hospital bed was still in the train's way when it hit it. Because it's from the train's point of view, thankfully we don't see anything after that. The video you're about to see is not graphic. It doesn't actually show any of the injury or the death that followed. However, knowing the context of the video, it is disturbing. Just a warning. In spite of their severe negligence and irresponsible decision resulting in not only injuries, but death, Randall Miller, the co-writer, director, and a producer of the film, along with his wife, Jody Savin, who was co-writer and producer, they both tried to resume filming right after the tragedy happened. The only reason they weren't able to is because William Hurt, pulled out of the film and thousands and thousands of people online, especially on Facebook, supported the decision to stop production of the film out of respect for Sarah and for her family. Like people were understandably outraged that they were just trying to continue filming as if nothing had happened, especially when it was their fault that it happened in the first place. So they were essentially forced to stop making the film in spite of the fact that they happily would have continued. So Randall Miller and Jody Savin, along with a couple of the other higher up crew members, would be charged with involuntary manslaughter as well as criminal trespassing. So Randall took a plea deal. Although he was technically sentenced to 10 years in prison, he would only have to serve one and then he would be released on probation. Jody was let off on all charges as part of the plea deal for her husband. So basically he took all the blame for it. So in exchange for pleading guilty, his wife got off. The other really scary thing about this is that, remember how they said that it was safe to film there and that they thought it was safe to film there? From what the CSX company claims, the one that owns the trains, they claim that they never gave permission for them to film there in the first place. They said that they had given them written denials twice that said they could not film there. For whatever reason, Randall and Jody claimed that they were confused and they didn't know that they weren't supposed to film there. Basically, to me, I think they were just playing dumb though. I'm pretty sure they knew they weren't supposed to film there, but they really wanted to film there, so they thought they could just do it. Nobody would notice and they'd get away with it. Hence the criminal trespassing charge. Anyway, the entire ordeal was the catalyst for the campaign Safety for Sarah movement that called for increased safety on film sets in Sarah Jones's name. Popular shows such as The Vampire Diaries and The Walking Dead would pay tribute to Sarah by dedicating episodes to her. I didn't know the situation that surrounded Sarah's death, but I do remember like Nina Dubrov doing a little like Instagram post about her because I think she used to work on the set of The Vampire Diaries. So didn't know that that's how she passed away though. So unbelievably tragic and unnecessary. Okay, everybody, that is gonna be it for today's video. I hope you liked this episode of Can't Look Away. I know the stories are really sad, but if you want to give this video a like just merely to support me and the channel, that would be great. Thank you guys so much, and I will see you next week. Thank you to all my patrons. Special shout out to Top Tiers, Colin Holmes, Deck of Cards, Michelle Valdovinos, Tom L., 
JJ, Quasi Eli, Little Kittle Cat, Whimsicott Fan, Delta Wolf 776, Mitchell Schaefer Meyer, Mike, Alice Paul, Dark Sided Otter, Brittany Phillips, Willow Winchester, Amanda Klein, Bambi, Nyanu Kianu, Momo Nia, Philip J, Kovi, David 88, Sonder, Marita 144, and Sage K.